So this is an introductory course to deep learning. And uh, if you want to know more about the subject after the course, there's a lot of uh, excellent books and free online material available. Um, if you're really new to the field, I also recommend that you go uh, to this uh, playground at TensorFlow, where you can play around with uh, neural nets, uh, different architectures, different activation functions, and so on. I'd like to start with a short history of deep learning. Neural networks were invented as a simple model uh, to study um, how neural circuits process information. The first important result was published by McCulloch and Pitt in 43 already, where they showed that these uh, neural nets or multilayer perceptrons, as they were called at the time, are capable of universal computation. A little bit later, uh, Rosenblatt uh, published the first learning algorithm, so introduced these neural networks to machine learning, which was uh, quite unstable. And he also provided a hardware implementation of a multi-layer perceptron. Um, then in 74, probably uh, by several orders, more or less at the same time, a better way to train neural networks was invented by gradient descent and backpropagation. However, it took a while until uh, this algorithm was really applied. Uh, it was this uh, important paper by Rumblehart, Hinton, and Williams that used backpropagation to train a simple uh, neural network that was able to predict words. We come back to that uh, during the lecture. Before that, uh, Fukushima uh, produced the first convolutional neural network that was used to read uh, Japanese characters, but it was not yet trained with back, back propagation, so it was very uh, cumbersome to train. Then uh, Jan Le Guin, uh, produced LeNet, which was a convolutional neural network fully trained by backpropagation. And he showed that this network is capable of uh, outperforming other uh, machine learning methods such as SVMs. And it was actually the first neural network that was then used by the US Postal Service to read handwritten postal codes that was actually used in the practice. Uh, during the 90s here, the neural deep learning or deep neural networks were still uh, at the beginning, but a lot of important uh, inventions were already done then. Uh, for example, these recursive neural networks were introduced by uh, Schuster and Pulival, and then the long short-term memory networks were introduced by Hochreiter and Schmidhuber. If you count the citations uh, or compare the citations for deep learning uh, to the citations uh, for artificial neural networks, which uh, correspond to shallow neural networks with maybe one layer, uh, deep neural networks have, let's say, at least three layers, or uh, support vector machines, you see that up to uh, maybe 2010, uh, there were much more citations for uh, shallow neural networks or support vector machines. But the number of citations started to grow uh, very quickly after 2010, and uh, neural networks or deep uh, neural networks are now probably the most important uh, method to do uh, machine learning. So what happened around uh, 2010? Um, much of it is due to uh, Jeffrey Hinton, who was also the, who led this uh, CIFAR Institute in Canada. And he really believed uh, that uh, deep learning can work at a time where most of the people uh, were very skeptical about it. 
he has an interesting career. He's uh, actually a trained psychologist. So he he knew that the brain uh, is a highly over parameterized system, but it is capable of efficient learning. And he thought that he can somehow emulate that with deep neural networks as well. Then uh, probably one of the most important things that also happened was that uh, deep neural networks could be trained on uh, graphical processors, so-called GPUs, and that allowed to parallelize and largely accelerate uh, the training of these networks. And there was especially the group of Andrew Ng that uh, contributed a lot to this uh, technique here. Then deep neural networks also started to outperform other uh, approaches in these uh, competitions you often have in, in uh, computer science, for example, for phone classification or speech processing. Uh, Hinton and this group produced uh, a neural network that outperformed all the other approaches. It's also important that neither Hinton nor uh, Mohamed were, were uh, kind of specialists in, in uh, speech processing, so they were able to come up with a, and train a neural network within a short time, actually, and outperform other systems that were done by groups that actually that only did uh, speech processing. Um, then more uh, known, probably better known, is the so-called AlexNet, which was uh, produced by Alex Krzyzewski, Ilya Suskever, and uh, Jeffrey Hinton in 2012. It's a convolutional network that used uh, all the modern techniques that were available. So they used backpropagations on GPUs. Uh, they use the ReLU activation and dropout and data augmentation. I will explain what all these things are later. And they won this ImageNet competition in 2012 with a clear advantage to the runner-up. Later on, Suskever then uh, went to Google and started developing a language models there, which then led to the uh, these GPT models, which we have now with OpenAI. Part of the deep learning success is also due to open source code. So all the these, deep, these frameworks were um, developed like TensorFlow or PyTorch, which are very robust and which make it uh, deep learning easy to use for the machine learning community. And all this uh, led to the fact that uh, the Turing Award, which was one of the main awards in computer science was given to uh, Jeffrey Hinton, Joshua Bengio, Bengio and uh, Jan Le Kuhn in 2018. So this is uh, a graph that shows uh, for this ImageNet competition, that shows the top five classification error. ImageNet is a, an assembly of about 1,200,000 images with 2,000 categories. And sometimes these images have several objects in them and you have to classify which objects are present in these images. Um, so in 2012, this, uh, the first neural net, this AlexNet was introduced and you see that uh, it really quite drastically reduced uh, the error compared to the winner of the previous year. And after that, all the winners of the uh, following years were based on neural network architectures. What you also see is that AlexNet uh, had a depth of eight layers, so it was already deep, but not, not very, very deep. Then uh, the tendency was that this uh, neural network, so the winner of 2014, Google NeuralNet had 22 layers, and the winner of 2015, the ResNet had uh, 152 layers. So there was a tendency uh, to uh, increase the number of layers to increase the depth of the neural network. However, depth is not everything. For example, uh, this uh, ZF net, the Tyler Fergus net, uh, is, was actually the same as the Alex net, but it was just differently parameterized. It's also, it's not only the depth, it's also how. Uh, the, the details, how you use these networks, that makes a big difference. 
and very importantly is also that the number of parameters uh, or weights in the AlexNet was uh, 62 million. Uh, and this compares to uh, 1,200 uh, training uh, examples. And this was really the astonishing fact that such a completely overparameterized neural net, we have 60 times more parameters than uh, training examples, was able to uh, generalize, was able to perform well on a completely independent uh, test set. And this was kind of contradictory to what the general belief was in the machine learning community at the time. And this really led to sort of a paradigma shift uh, in the thinking. So the tendency to increase the debt went on. And nowadays, as you all know, uh, we have uh, GPT-4 with a trillion of parameters. These networks really became huge. Uh, they became so big that uh, developing such a network is uh, becoming very, very costly. And also running the network, the computational power, the electricity you need uh, to support that is has also a huge cost. Okay, this was uh, just very short history introduction. Now we'd like to go uh, and try to find out what, uh, what deep learning actually does, on which uh, principle it is found. So the basic building block uh, of a neural net is this uh, single layer perceptron. It's a very simple thing. Actually, as you will see, you have an input vector uh, x1 to xn. These are all numerical values. Neural nets can only deal with numerical values, not with categorical ones. Um, then you have n weights, so uh, w1 to wn, and an offset w0. What you do is you multiply each input, x1, with w1, and xn with wn, and you sum them all up. Then you add the offset to it, and you pass this affine transformation to an activity or a gating function, which is often, uh, for example, the, the sigmoid function, which is zero for a very negative value, then comes linear around zero, and then flattens again for very positive value. And this gives you uh, the output of your neural net. Uh, if you plot that output of a neural net uh, for a two dimensions, so you just have an input vector of uh, x1 and x2. Then you see that uh, in this region here, you have, uh, uh, with the sigmoid activation function, you have zero. Then um, it uh, goes over a step here, starts growing up a step, and it becomes one on the other side of the step. Uh, the step uh, corresponds to this linear equation here, which is just our fine transformation we do in this neural network. And the weight vector w is orthogonal uh, to this step. Also important to know is that the larger or the longer the weights, the larger the weights w are, the steeper the step is. The smaller the weights w are, the flatter or smoother the step is. Now, things, this, uh, with this system, we can only do uh, linear uh, separations between classes. So maybe not particularly interesting. The same thing we can do with logistic regression. It starts getting more interesting if you, start, if you combine different single layer perceptrons together. Uh, here, again, we have only a two-dimensional input and we have three perceptrons, uh, Z1, Z2, and Z3. And these three perceptrons then in the next layer are combined again uh, to give the final output. Now we want to look a little bit in detail uh, how this works. So the first uh, perceptron here is this one here. I just gave um, uh, random weights to these things. So the Two weights here are minus one, minus one, and offset is three. And if you plot 
that result, uh, we, for simplicity, we assume that we have a stepwise activation function. Um, if you plot that result, you see that this uh, output here at set one is zero in this region and one in this region. If you take the second uh, perceptron, set two, uh, also gave some weight to that one, and you can plot again how the output looks like, and you see as a function of x1 and x2, that uh, z2 is zero in this region and one in this region. And then we go to z3. Uh, again, we, for this uh, set of parameters, we can show that z3 is one in this region and zero in this region. Now in the next layer, we uh, add another uh, single layer perceptron. So we combine all these three outputs of the first layer, Z1, Z2, and Z3, uh, with a new perceptron. And uh, the weights are one here. So we just add these numbers together and then we subtract an offset of minus 2.5. If you do that, uh, we will uh, obtain, without subtracting the offset yet, uh, we will obtain this one here. So in the region where all the one regions here overlap, uh, we add those up, we get three. In the regions we, where we have uh, one zero region, we get two. And uh, where we only have one uh, region with uh, one, we get one. If we, add this. If we uh, subtract 2.5, all these regions here around three become negative. The only one that remains positive is uh, this three region here. And then we apply our stepwise activation functions, meaning all the regions that are lower than three become zero and this region here becomes one. So what we did here was actually, we separated this triangular region from all the rest and uh, we can for example, use this as a classifier if you want to classify all the points within the triangle uh, in comparison to all of the points outside the triangle, we could use that with a system like this. Now you can imagine that if you start adding more uh, single layer perceptrons, maybe in the first layer and more in the second layer and add more layers as well, that we can fit more and more complicated um, shapes. Um, if you do that, uh, usually we do that not with a stepwise activation function, but for example, the sigmoid activation function, then we get obviously not these hard uh, boundaries, but more uh, soft boundaries, as you can see. Here. As I said, uh, we can do this now, we can extend this, we can add more uh, neurons or more single layer perceptrons in the first. Uh, layer, we can add a second layer as well uh, before we go to the final layer. And as you can see, uh, this is from a publication here, uh, that already by doing that, you can fit these uh, quite complicated shapes. So you can separate these two um, concentric circles uh, from uh, these uh, uh, shapes here. And uh, you this is uh, done for, for these shapes, but if you have even more complicated shapes, you might want to add more layers. And we will see that you can fit basically any shape if you add enough layer to your neural network. So these uh, deep neural networks, uh, they uh, look like this. So as we saw, they have an input vector here, an input layer of uh, dimension n. Then we have um, uh, hidden layers, maybe more than three, otherwise we probably won't call it deep learning. Uh, we have these hidden layers and each uh, neuron here in the hidden layer is uh, a single layer perceptron. So it is activated like a single uh, perceptron. So we add, uh, we, it has weights, it has a weight vector. We multiply this weight vector with the input vector, we add an offset and we pass it through 
an activation function. And we do this for each neuron here. And then for the neurons in the next layer, we use the neurons in the previous layer as input and proceed in the same way and so on until we come to our output neurons. Um, so you can have different activation functions. Often one uses the ReLU activation functions in the hidden layers and maybe the sigmoid or uh, the softmax uh, in, in the final layer, especially for classification. You often want to know what is the probability of a class and there that is usually done with the softmax uh, activation in the last layer. Now it can be shown mathematically, and this goes back quite a while, that actually shallow neural networks, or neural networks with just one layer, are already capable of universal computation. So you can fit any functions, uh, any function you want with it, uh, if you just add enough uh, nodes in that single layer. Now, why do we need deep learning if you can do everything already with uh, one layer? It turns out that if you, instead of one layer, we have a stack of, uh, of layers, we can do that same task, but much more efficiently. So we can do it with less weight and much less training time. Uh, and the reason for that is you can, to a certain extent, prove that mathematically, um, especially if the data or, or the function you want to fit has some sort of hierarchical structure, which is often the case, uh, for example, for images or for text where you have uh, paragraphs, sentences, which then are composed of words and so on. So if you have this type of structure, uh, you can show that uh, this deep architecture uh, should perform better than this shallow one. And the reason for that, as we will see, is that if you uh, have these uh, deep architectures, you can uh, argue in the following way that each layer is able to extract ex essential information from the previous layer and then pass it on to the next layer, which uh, again extracts essential information. And you can build up like a hierarchical system like this that in the last layers is then to able to extract the information that you uh, want for classification, for example, and uh, perform uh, a perfect classification. So what we need to know at this point is that these neural networks, the shallow and the deep ones, but the deep ones do that more efficiently, are universal function approximators, so they can uh, fit any doesn't even need to be smooth. Um, any function, more or less, um, uh, of an input vector. And we have uh, learning algorithms that are uh, able to efficiently learn the weights that uh, can achieve this thing. And the magic of a deep neural network is then that we can fully fit in many cases, our uh, training data, but also generalize well on our independent test data. And here is from uh, a publication which I will cite uh, frequently in this uh, talk. It's from Joshua Bengia's group, Bengio's group. And here they show that this uh, universal approximation property of deep neural networks. What they did is that they, they took this uh, CIFAR data set and just randomized the labels of the images. So instead of a bird, you call it a dog and you just randomize the labels or you shuffle, uh, you shuffle all the pixels uh, or you use completely random pixels or you add Gaussian noise. And still, uh, the neural network was able to train it without uh, training uh, error. So they was able to perfectly fit even this completely randomized uh, image. 
So this shows the this universal this approximation properties of the neural network. Of course, fitting random data is not useful. So uh, you this type of neural networks will perform very badly on test data. This is just to show the point that uh, these neural networks are universal approximators. So you can basically fit everything you want to fit, uh, assuming that the neural network is deep and wide enough uh, to have the capacity for this fit. Now, the way neural networks uh, train or the navy way we work with neural networks is quite different from the way uh, traditional, let's call it traditional machine learning used to work. In this more traditional approach, uh, you as a data scientist, you were given some data, you looked at the data, you analyzed the data, and you talk to the people who are experts in the data, and then you extracted features that describe this data or these images, for example, well, for example, for images, you might extract edge detectors or circle detectors or color histograms or things of that sort. Then you combine all these uh, features in a feature vector and you add the labels, labels in, your, in case it's uh, supervised classification and you pass the feature vectors and the labels to a classifier, for example, support vector machine that then learns how to uh, classify, learns a model how to classify uh, these items here. So you need some expert knowledge. You need to understand the data to a certain extent uh, to have uh, to come up with good features. Marcus, Feature there is a question. Yes. There, are, there is there are three questions in the chat. Right. One is in deep learning neural network CNN. What is the rule of thumb of n hidden layers when we do the modeling? Yeah, I'll come to that point uh, later. So there's uh, I, I have a slide on that. Okay. So um, and there are the other two yes. yeah. difference between deep learning neural network and GAN general generative adversarial network. Are you going to talk about this too? No, I won't talk about uh, GNs. Uh, GNs is, is a way, these are also neural networks, uh, deep neural networks, but it's just a way to train them. Mm -hmm. um, I won't have time to go into this. Maybe one do will uh, talk a little bit about those. And the question was at the end, the third one then is if that can be, this GANs can be modeled on uh, Google Collab or Python? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there should be. A, uh, well, GINs are, are usually very expensive to train, so I'm not quite sure how. Well, that works on Colab, but basically, I would say yes, you have uh, GINs implementations in TensorFlow, and you can run them on Colab. Thank you. All right. Okay, so the the way deep learning works is different in deep learning. You don't do uh, feature detection. You just take the raw images. And uh, so we take the pixel values uh, of these raw images. You design your neural net, which has then several layers and certain width. And you just pass these raw images to the neural network. And you also give it the labels. So the, you tell the neural network it should adapt the weights in such a way that it can uh, attribute these images to the right labels. And by doing that, almost magically, the neural network will, uh, in the consecutive layers, will uh, design its own uh, feature, uh, feature detectors or features. And uh, usually, that's not a general rule, but what it usually does in the first layer for these images, it has the basic features like uh, edge detectors. Then in the next layer, it kind of combines these edge detectors, maybe has corner detectors or more complicated shapes. And then if you go down uh, the layers, uh, the, these features become more and more complex until they're complex enough to decide whether this uh, image is, is a bike, a cow, or a toaster. So this is the, the very... Uh, 
rough overview of what neural networks are doing. You can uh, look at real examples. This is from Silent Fergus, who won this uh, ImageNet competition in 2013. So they used AlexNet. And they also won it because they, they studied how AlexNet actually works and what it's doing. And they uh, found a way to visualize uh, these uh, activations or feature maps here. I uh, can't get into that. So they developed a neural networks, especially for that. But what they saw is that in the first layer in this convolutional network, uh, we have these uh, simple uh, edge detectors here. Then in the second layers, these uh, become more complex already. You have these corner detectors, round shape detectors, color detectors, or pattern detectors. And uh, if you go down in the layers, these uh, features become more and more complex. But the, the interesting thing is that you didn't design these features, but the neural network, just by being forced to learn uh, to classify these images, uh, came up with these features by itself. Now, this is the, the famous paper by Rummelhart, Hilton, uh, Hinton, and Williams, where they, uh, it was actually a very simple system. So they just had. Uh, two family trees, an Italian one and an uh, English one. And you see here the association. So Roberto is married to Maria and they have uh, children. And uh, this uh, daughter, Lucia, is married again and so on. And uh, you give in the, in this neural network here, you see the architecture of the neural network. You put in a name and the relation, for example, um, Lucia is daughter of, and the answer should be um, Roberto and Maria. Okay, so the, it's really a very simple system, but what they did, they used this backpropagation algorithm, and they showed that uh, by just sampling uh, examples from this uh, data here and feeding it to the neural network for training, they could actually perfectly train that network. And the interesting thing is that here you have the, the input vector, which is just the one hot encoding of the name. So if the name is, is uh, Christopher, this is a one, and all the other ones are zeros. If the name is Andrews, uh, this is zero, this is one, and all the other ones are zero. So this is a non-informative encoding of the names. But in first layer already of this name encoding, uh, what they saw is that the neural network learns so-called uh, feature maps or embeddings that uh, are much more informative. For example, uh, for uh, the feature map here for Andrew and Christine is actually the same because uh, they're uh, married to each other and the Distinction through a relation always comes, only comes into the network at the later point. So at this point, uh, all these couples have the same feature map. And the first uh, dimension, the feature map tells us on which family tree we are. In this case, we are on the English family tree. The second dimension tells us uh, in which generation we are, and so on. So this uninformative input vector is projected on, onto an embedding, which is much more informative. And then uh, on the next embedding, which then takes in the information of the relations, further embedding, and here we have enough information then just to do the classification. This was actually the first uh, network that uh, somehow processed languages in that uh, sense. It was only simple words and relations, but in that sense, this was the first uh, little simple language model. Now, these word embeddings are very central uh, to neural networks. Um, so again, we I want to illustrate that in a simple example here. So we have a sentence, the dog barks. If you do the, the one hot encoding, uh, so we, for example, we say that D is one zero, the vector one zero zero, we only have three words here. 
dog is one zero one and parts is zero zero. You see that all these vectors are orthogonal and equidistant, so there's no information in this uh, encoding. Now imagine we do this uh, for a real language with uh, ten thousands of uh, of words. Then we have this very long. Uh, Marcus, I cannot hear of, you anymore. Sorry. So uh, yeah, I cannot hear you. Okay. Is that Can you me? hear me better Maybe. now? I'm I better now. Hear you. Yeah, now it's better. Sorry. Okay, I have to go a little bit closer to the mic. It seems. Yeah, it's maybe me because everybody's hearing. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. So in this, uh, we would rather have an encoding or an embedding of these words in a, in a vector space that is more informative. For example, that where dog and parks they belong together only a dog parks. Uh, where these vectors are close together, or where a cat and meows are close together, or where dog and cat, which are both both pets uh, with four legs and a tail, uh, close together but far apart from other objects like moon. And how uh, can we train such an embedding? We can this uh, what neural networks are really good at. We can use a neural network as was done in this famous uh, word to vec uh, publication by Nikolov and also Suskaver um, at Google. At the time. So what they did is they uh, tokenized the uh, text and they uh, split it into pairs of words that appear together in uh, short bits of this text. For example, that and dog appear together, dog and that appear together, dog and parks appear together, and so on. And they complemented that with negative examples of words that do not appear together in the text. And they fed this into a, a one layer neural network. This was actually a simple neural network here. It's just a projection matrix, basically. And they had an objective function that. Uh, forces words that appear together in the same sentence to be close together and words that don't appear together to be popular. And if you do that, that creates then an embedding uh, for you. And it turns out that this embedding is actually uh, then very uh, is interesting and informative. For example, uh, all the country names seem to uh, be uh, clustered together if you this was a thousand dimensional embedding and this is just the pca projection in the first two dimensions but in this projection all the country names cluster together all the names of capitals also seem to cluster together and interestingly uh, the distance between the country and the capital is more or less a constant vector so for all the examples here we have about the same distance between country and uh, capital, which just means this uh, there's information encoded into this embedding, which was not present in the original input vectors. Then we can use this embedding for many things. So we can use for words that are close to other words. For example, my bike has a flat. We can look for words that are close to bike uh, and flat, for example, this will most likely be a tire. Um, we can relate different sentences to each other. So we can relate the sentence, the dog walk, walks in the park to a cat creeps around the field because both sentences contain pets, both sentences contain uh, a verb that uh, describes a movement and a place. So if you Calculate the probability how similar these sentences are, they will be more similar than another language. If you embed several languages together, you can do that. Uh, then you can use this type of systems, not word to vec, but the more complicated systems to do a translation of language. So you can turn the dog walks in the park to the hund spaziert in park. And you can even embed text and images together and then use that to translate text into images or uh, provide uh, text that describes images. 
So the concept of this embedding is very central to deep learning and is used uh, all over the place. Okay, so how the next chapter, maybe we have a, a little break here just to recap a little bit so you can go through the slides again. Uh, this will be uh, now a more technical part where I try to tell you how you choose the number of layers, how you choose the activation function and so on. Uh, and before that, we just have a five minute breaks and then go on. And please ask uh, if you have questions. So everyone, five minutes break, and then uh, you can turn on your microphones and speak up, ask questions, or add them to the chat as well. Welcome to do the best way for you. Ah, and I'm going to copy the link to the Google Doc. Do we have the link? to the slides as well to everyone here in the chat in case you didn't receive that. So there's a question from um, in the chat. Could you please explain what the back, back propagation is? I will come to that. Mm -hmm. Good. Hopefully that will be clearer. So hold your expectations, Frédéric. It's going to come. <laughs> But if I can say the back propagation is just an efficient way to calculate the gradient, uh, you learn these networks by doing gradient descent. And uh, that would be very time consuming to do if uh, we wouldn't have the back propagation algorithm. How this works, I will, I will explain. There's another question again, also very informative. Thank you. You mentioned that in the last layer, we subtract an offset. What is that exactly? How we determine that? Well, it's not only in the last layer that we are subtract an offset. In each, for each neuron, we, uh, in the perceptron or for each neuron in, in the neural network, we subtract an offset. And that offset is also learned. So we don't know the offset. We don't know the weights. And the aim of the learning is exactly to uh, learn the weights and the offset. All the other things we provide, we tell the network how many layers, uh, we define the architecture, we define the activation functions, normalizations, and all these things. We predefine both the weights and the offsets the network has to learn. This is exactly what the, the learning algorithm is. There's another question as well. How long is the vector space for encoding words like uh, 010, 0100, et cetera? How long is necessary the vector to be? Well, if the, the first encoding, if you just use that one hot encoding, this is basically the number of words in your language. So if you have a language with 100,000 words, that input vector will have a length of 100,000. It will be very sparse because if you have what you have one word you encode with that, and uh, there will be uh, 99,999 zeros and one one. It's a very inefficient uh, way to encode a vector, but that's how we usually do it in the input. But then the, what the neural network does is it creates this embedding, and the embedding has maybe a dimension of thousand or something like that which is then much more informative and groups works together according to their meaning and their position in sentences and so on. And there's another question as well. Oops. Is the embedding always the first layer of the neural network? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, the, no, it's actually each layer creates an embedding. 
Um, maybe the first layer is not the most useful embedding for the problem you want to solve, but somehow each layer creates an embedding of the previous layer. So each layer in certain sense summarizes what was there in the previous layer and organizes the previous layer in such a way that it is useful for the task you have to solve, for example, for a classification or a regression. This is what the neural networks do internally. And this is somehow magic uh, how this works. Uh, it's not always uh, easy to understand. It's not always easy to interpret what the neural networks do. But as a general principle, I think that's more or less what's going on. Uh, I'll complete that. Uh, no, there is a question related to that. And then I'll come back to another one that came. How do we know which layer or embedding is informative? <laughs> That's a good question uh, as well. Then uh, we have to figure it out. So what you can do is you can uh, take each layer and you have to have some objective function to define what is informative. And then you can maybe just have a lo single logistic regression and try to regress that layer on this informative measure and see which layer gives you the most information on that. And then you can figure out uh, which layer has the most information. But usually, the further, the deeper you go in your network, the more informative the layers become on the task uh, the neural network is training. Another question now. You mentioned that the number of parameters in neural networks can be much higher than the number of training data points, and that it can still general generalize well contrary to the common belief for traditional machine learning approaches. Is it a default characteristics of neural network, or is it only possible with the use of special tricks during the training? Or we will talk no, about this. It seems to be a default mechanism. It seems to be linked to the way neural networks train without any tricks. So it's just the, the gradient descent uh, algorithm to train the neural network makes that you uh, end up in a you usually find even the global minimum with that, I come to that. And you find the, the global minimum is a very broad space in these overparameterized networks. And you find a point in the global minimum that even generalizes well. So uh, people were not aware of that. Uh, when uh, Jeffrey Hinton wasn't aware of that at the time, he just knew these things work. Uh, he didn't know why, but now uh, one more and more figures out why these things actually work. And it seems to be due to that. Uh, gradient descent uh, learning. There's a very nice paper. This uh, paper I cited frequently from Joshua Bengio's group uh, that describes this a little bit. So I recommend reading. And it's linked in your slides also. Yeah, that's you find the link. Yeah. So it's this saying at all. Mm -hmm. And there's another question also Are there some rules of thumb for how lar large a label data set needs to be for the deep learning to be useful for a particular application? Yeah, I, I was thinking about that as well. I would say 10,000, but I don't know really. It's really uh, a rule, I rule of deep thumb. Deep learning with 200 training examples. Again, you can do uh, deep learning in the sense you can do transfer learning. So if you have a, a system or a model that was already trained on a lot of data, uh, then you can, like ChatGTP, you can uh, train it on a particular task. Um, you can do that with uh, little training data. But uh, to train a, a neural network or deep neural network from scratch, I would say I wouldn't try with less than 10,000, but that's just my guess. So I think you just need to find it out. And, um, if you have just a few data points, like uh, 1,000 or something, I would just use uh, logistic regression or things like uh, gradient boosting algorithms, which perform much better on this smaller data set. Two questions also, how can we determine or optimize the number of neurons or layers needed? You have to experiment. So uh, I come to that as well, but you start with a certain, maybe you will read the literature, you will see what other people are doing. You take an example from the literature, you might add uh, a couple of layers, you might change the architecture a little bit, and you have to experiment and see what, what gives you the best result. 
so far we don't have a nice uh, like theory or something that tells us for this type of data this type of networks works. one last question then what do you think of manually setting features that are super supposed to be learned by each each layer manually setting the weights uh, uh, the feature yeah the weights features yeah weights mm -hmm. yeah so manually setting the weights i mean if you have uh, 60 million weights i don't think that's uh, something you want to do but that's what people did in in the early days of the neural network for example example that neocognitron was basically manually trained so there was a very cumbersome uh, process now to to put the features somehow constrain the neural network to come up with specific features that's maybe something you could try i wouldn't quite know how to do that though um i haven't seen that so the 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 power of the neural network is actually more that you don't do this type of things that you really let the neural network figure out what are what is the best way uh, to fix that data Another question also, do the deep learning methods rely on what is present in trained data for it to work efficiently on test data in general? The animals, cat, dog, cat in training data, does it restrict to those keywords in, in the test data or any, an animal like horse can be equally classified efficiently with deep learning, without learning, I guess this. Um, that's also a very good question. I, I would say no. Um, what is not in the training data is usually not predictable in the test data. Just maybe in very rare cases, if you have, sometimes the, the networks can somehow generalize, but it's more the exception than I mean. I, I would say no. Generally. Right. We don't have any questions anymore. <laughs> you okay, didn't have a break, but some people had. <laughs> it was a... Not a five minute break, was a 10 minute break. <laughs> fine as well. 10 minutes for questions. Right. All right. Okay, now we come a bit to a more technical part that uh, discusses a bit how many layers. I mean, it's an introduction. I have to be really brief and uh, I cannot explain all the details. So if you really want to know more about this, you have to. Uh, go back uh, to other resources or to uh, uh, to try that out yourself. So the first is how many layers uh, do I want to have in my neural networks? The answer is actually uh, I don't know. As I already said, you might uh, read uh, literature, you might compare what other people are doing, and but you have to experiment. You have to uh, increase the number of layers and also the width of the layers. Uh, to be able to fit what you want to fit. Because if the neural network is too small, you can't do that. Once you're sure that you can fit that, you might add a couple of other layers uh, because the neural networks can cope with that and to give it more, even more flexibility. Uh, this is sometimes called the stretch pen approach. So you, you have something that is way too large and then uh, the tr in, during training, this will adapt itself the actual data. So uh, unfortunately, I can not tell you much more than that. Um, there are investigations. Of course, there's a relationship between uh, the amount of training data you have and uh, some sort of optimal number of layers. For example, this one was done for the ResNet, which is also a winner of this uh, competition. So we can change the number of layers it has. And you see that there's a clear uh, relationship between the training data size and the number of parameters in, in this uh, ResNet architecture. Um, so, but this relationship will be different for different networks. Again, I don't think, if you don't have a lot of experience in the field, the only way to do that is to figure it out, to run uh, different depths of the network, different widths of the network, and to find out which network then generalizes. Uh, the best. So this 
So what do we do in uh, when we train a neural network or generally a machine learning model? Uh, we have a so-called loss function. This is uh, signified as J here. And this loss function depends on the internal parameters of the neural network, which are the weights and the offsets. And we would like to find uh, th those weights and offsets that gives us uh, the smallest loss. And the loss uh, measures uh, how good our predictions are in comparison to the true labels. So how close our predictions are to the true labels. If we, we have perfect, perfect prediction, then the loss is zero. If we have bad predictions, then the loss will be really high. So we want to minimize the loss. And then once we learned uh, these optimal weights here, we will use these weights to predict uh, with the model on an independent test. Now, typically, uh, we always use the empirical loss, so we don't have a mathematical idea how this loss function uh, looks like. So we estimate it by using our training data. So we just sum the loss of each training uh, item in the training data. We sum that up over all items in the training data. Typically, we have uh, the, these two losses here. We have the square loss, which is just the output of the neural network minus the desired or the, the target uh, output. And then squared, we don't care whether it's too high or too low. We just square, care how far away from the target it is. This is often used for regression, but you can also use it for classification. Uh, for, for classification, we often use the cross entropy loss. We just, um, in, in, if you do classification, we calculate probabilities that a certain item belongs to a certain class. And we want that this probability is really high for the target class and low for the other classes. And the cross entropy loss evaluates. Now we come to what was already discussed a little bit before, uh, to this loss landscape, which is uh, quite an interesting subject. Um, if you, uh, this is uh, like a huge uh, dimensional space of all the weights and the loss function is a function of these weights. So uh, it corresponds uh, to like a function in a multiple dimension space. Now uh, we would like to know what is the structure of this uh, loss landscape. And it turns out, at least according to this publication here, um, that for uh, underparameterized uh, systems, like we used to have before the neural network, the loss landscape is often consists of multiple local minima, uh, which are convex. However, for this very overparameterized system, it turns out surprisingly that the loss function almost becomes simpler. It, uh, instead of having multiple local minima, it uh, has a few global minima, which corresponds to very broad uh, values. So the values. And um, the dimension of these values is almost as large as the dimension of the whole space. So it's uh, it's quite easy for gradient descent actually to find these uh, global minimums. That's also maybe the reason uh, this has been proved mathematically, uh, the structure of this minima by Cooper. Um, and this could indicate that it's actually quite easy to, to find these uh, global minima. But even within a global minimum, uh, you can wander around and not all, all the points within the global minimum generalize equally well. So, uh, you have to find a, a point in the global minimum. There's a global minimum with training data. That doesn't really mean it also performs super well on the test data. It turns out again, this again, this publication by Tseng and other publications as well, that the stochastic gradient descent or the gradient descent 
takes you to a point in this global minimum that uh, generalizes quite well, especially if you combine it with early stopping. So if you start wandering around this uh, flat value here, you might wander off a good solution. But if you stop at the right time, you can obtain a good solution. So how does this gradient descent work? We will start at a certain point. We do not necessarily know which point we have to start at. And we just go downhill um, because if we go downhill, we ensure that we minimize the loss until we reach uh, the end of the downhill, until it doesn't go any further. And we can do this with a gradient descent. So gra the gradient tells us how the function changes. And if we go down the negative gradient, we will ensure that we always uh, make the functions uh, smaller. And that's what we want to do. And then we have an important parameter as well is the step size. So uh, which step you want to take. If you go downhill, if that uh, step is too small, it takes too much time. If it's too large, we might overshoot. And now uh, the person who asked for back propagation, uh, please pay attention. We use back propagation to calculate this gradient efficiently. That's uh, basically what it is. It's uh, somehow a, a computational trick uh, to have an efficient computation for the gradient. And let's uh, try to explain that on a very, very simple network with two input nodes and just one output node here. And this thing here is what you call a computation graph. So if you want to calculate uh, this output here, this is what the computer has to do to get from the input to the output. Now in the first layer, we have the two inputs and the two weights. And in the next layer of the computation graph, this is not doesn't correspond to the layer of the neural network. It's a more, uh, it's a finer structure. Um, in the next layer, we multiply the input x1 with the weight x1, uh, w1, the input x2 with the weight w, as we do in the in the perceptron. Thing. Then again, as we do in the perceptron, we add all these uh, multiplications up, and we add the offset. Okay, and this is in the computation graph done in this number. And also importantly, we always store the results of, of these uh, computations in the nodes. Then we have done our affine transformation here of the perceptron, and we have to pass that to our gating or activation function, uh, which is usually a function that is implemented already, so we don't need to learn that. Uh, the computer knows how to calculate that. Uh, the function end is delivered. And that gives us the output of the neural network. And then we compare that output, uh, the predicted output of the neural network to the target output, y, And we calculate our loss. OK, so far, we just did a prediction with the neural network. Now we want to calculate the gradient. And it turns out by using the chain rule, which you probably all know from your high school years, from your studies, um, we can go back in this uh, computation graph here and step by step uh, calculate the gradient. So how this works, uh, we show now. We go to the first node and calculate the gradient uh, so the, the, the derivative of j with respect to f. And is it, as you probably remember, this is just two times f minus y. And we know what f is, we know what y is, so because we stored the result here, and we can calculate. Okay. Then we go to the next node and calculate the change of y with respect to the result in that node, that is z. So the change of y uh, with respect to z is the change of y with respect to f times the change of f with respect to z, according to the chain. 
Now, this first term here we know already from the previous node, and the second term is just the derivative of the activation. Then we uh, also we combine that in the same node here. We also have the derivative of y with respect to the offset, and we calculate that in the same way. It gives us exactly the same result because this is just the sum here. So it doesn't the derivative of z with respect to w zero is one. So it's the same result as this one. So we already have one of our gradients. So we already know how j changes with the offset w0. We already gained that. Now we need uh, to know how j, j changes with the respect to the weights w1 and w2. And for that, we have to go further through that back through that computation graph. And here again, we calculate how j changes with respect to z1, again applying the chain rule. And uh, since this is just a simple uh, addition here, uh, it doesn't change anything. Then uh, we come to the last node, and then we calculate how uh, J changes with respect to W1 and W2, and uh, again apply the chain rule, and that gives us this final result. Okay, and this is it. So with going through the computation graph first to calculate the prediction, and then going all the way back uh, to calculate the gradients gave us all the gradients. So we have the grade, we only have three parameters in this simple example. But by going back to this computation graph, we get all. Uh, the derivatives of J with all the parameters in our network, just by passing two times through that computation. And you have to compare that to, uh, if you want to calculate, for example, your derivatives numerically, you have to calculate two values that are close together. So you have to already parse uh, two times the computation graph for each uh, weight in your network. And we have millions of weights, you have to do that a million times. So that would, completely slow down the learning and it would be impossible to learn. But with that back propagation, we can do that just by parsing the computation graph twice. So this is highly efficient way to calculate the gradient, which allows us then to train this, uh, this vast uh, parameter space. Now the training is not uh, at the beginning, people had quite a lot of problems with this training because if you calculate these derivatives, you see that they consist of products. And uh, the more parameters you, you have, the more, the longer these products get. Now, you all know that if you have a product of numbers that are smaller than one, they become, the longer the product is, they become smaller and smaller and smaller until they become so small that you have a computational overflow, the computer can't handle them anymore. If you have a product of numbers that are larger than one and you multiply them uh, larger than one and you have a very long product, then um, your numbers become larger and larger and larger and might explode. So these two problems were real problems people had training neural networks, especially at the beginning. Uh, especially if the neural networks are very large. But there are certain things you can do uh, about this, and uh, I'd like to present some of these techniques now. So the first thing you can uh, choose is the activation function. Um, the sinoid, sigmoid activation function is between zero and one at the tango. Tangent symbolicus activation function between minus one and minus one. These are usually used in the last layer uh, of the neural network if you want to force the output between uh, to be in a certain range. Uh, for example, sigma eight if it's between zero. And one. However, they have the disadvantage that if you have very large values, the gradient becomes zero, and this uh, gradient descent might uh, get stuck in this uh, point. That's why people came up with the rectified linear unit or ReLU activation function. 
which is very simple. It's uh, zero for all the negative values and the identity for all the positive. It has a kink here, but that doesn't seem to really bother uh, the gradient descent because the kink is just at one specific point and doesn't seem to matter. Um, so the advantage of this function is it doesn't saturate. So the gradient in this part here is never zero. The even if you have very, very high values, you always have a finite uh, gradient. Uh, it's very fast to calculate. And um, it also has a nice interpretation. It actually leads to a piecewise uh, linear spline interpolation of your uh, training data. And this is uh, this spline theory is very developed, so uh, one can uh, learn a lot by comparing these neural networks with this uh, spline uh, theories. There's some paper on that uh, if you're interested. Uh, it's quite fascinating. Uh, that's it. That's it. Okay, so that ReLU activation function is uh, often used in the hidden layers or in the final layers if you just want the positive output, whereas uh, these fu activation functions are usually only used in the last layers to avoid this saturation of gradients. Then you have other activation functions as well, which have uh, different advantages and disadvantages. What also turned out to be very important is the, the way you initialize your weight. So where do you start your gradient descent? So it showed that if, if, start, if the weights are too large, um, you already have, uh, because you always formed in these persotroms, you form these sums. And if you have thousands of parameters, these sums can become very large. And again, you might go uh, to places in your activation function where the gradient, for example, vanishes, or, uh, or it might be the whole thing might be unstable. So you'd rather start with uh, weights that are, that are adapted to the size of your networks and their several techniques uh, available here. I give the references uh, here. Usually this uh, initialization also depends a bit on the activation function. So we have slightly different uh, initialization for ReLU or for CELU or for uh, logistic. Then uh, the gradient descent is also important. How do we do uh, the gradient descent? Which algorithm do we use? If you use just the standard gradient descent and that gradient becomes zero, for example, here at the settle point, um, we get stuck because here you do a big jump, big jump, but here the gradient becomes smaller and smaller and here we get stuck. So and we get stuck in a, in, in a place where we don't not yet at the global minimum. So we don't want that. What can we do? It's like in skiing. If you if you see a flat part, what you do is you speed up and uh, you gain some speed, and that speed will carry you over that flat part. You can do that with uh, gradient descent as well. It's called momentum gradient descent. So we can uh, give that gradient uh, a certain push, and that push allows you then to go over that flat part, um, and then towards the global mean. But if you have too much push, uh, you might then overshoot a bit. So uh, it might take quite some time until you converge to the global minimum. So there are again, uh, improvements of that, for example, Nesterov gradient descent algorithm. It's again like skiing. In skiing, you always look a little bit ahead. You see, okay, it's getting too steep. Now I maybe break a little bit. Um, and the Nesterov uh, algorithm also does that it calculates the gradient not at the place where it actually is, but at the projected place where it's going to be. And this helps and it uh, accelerates convergence. And then there are further other gradients uh, from that time to discuss. Here, the important thing is if you use uh, frameworks like TensorFlow or PyTorch, this is just a parameter in your learning step. You can just uh, choose, just give the keyword and choose the gradient descent algorithm you want to use. And there's also something you can experiment with. 
Then the learning rate is equally important. If you have a learning rate that is way too high, we kind of overshoot the we jump over the, the global minimum and we will not be able to go back there again. So we end up in a, in a not optimal solution. If the gradient, if the learning rate is still a little bit too high, we might find the optimal solution, but then there we will jump around quite a bit and it will have difficulties uh, to converge. And that is shown here, it's fairly noisy um, behavior on the training loss and the validation. If you have about the right uh, speed or learning rate, then the convergence get smoother and we will converge to the global uh, optimum eventually. If the rainy learning rate is much too small, we just don't converge, uh, we will get stuck or it will just take too long. And when we stop, sorry, when we stop the training, then uh, we will not be at the optimum point. Yeah. So again, uh, this uh, learning rate is an important parameter which you also have to experiment. One very powerful technique is called early stopping, which is not uh, only used in neural networks, it's a general machine learning technique. Um, when we train our model, we train it on the training data. Uh, and as I said, uh, since these are uh, general function approximators, we can make the loss on the training data zero almost. But the important thing is how this performs on the test data. We know that we can fit any training data, but we want to be good on the test data. So what we usually do when we train neural networks, we give it a training uh, data set and uh, an independent validation data set. And we look at the loss of both and the, the TensorFlow uh, or PyTorch uh, export both values. So you can look at them and you see that maybe after a certain training, you may be already in that global minimum somewhere, but then you start to kind of overfit. You start to wander off the point in the global minimum that is, yes, gives you good generalization. And there you need to stop. And how do you know where this point is? This is the point where your validation loss starts increasing again while the training loss still is going down, but the validation loss is going down. And you can figure it out, you can tell the network, okay, if uh, doesn't the validation loss doesn't go down for so many steps, just take the best um, uh, parameter settings before uh, that stage. This is a very powerful technique that avoids overfitting and that gives you better generalization. Another important technique is uh, that we don't do gradient descent on all our training data, but we do what is called stochastic uh, gradient descent. Uh, and that works in the following way. We batch or we split our training data into small batches. We randomly split it. Uh, the batch size is usually 32 or 64, so it's quite small. And the idea behind that is twofold. So first, we can easily parallelize it. We can run each batch uh, independently. The second idea is that if one batch maybe gets stuck in a, in somewhere in the, on the gradient descent or has uh, some sort of difficulties, another batch will not have these difficulties. So we also have some batches that are able to overcome is local minima and we get a better conversions that way. So this is also a powerful technique, which is kind of, I guess it's standard usage nowadays um, that you train on batches and not on the whole uh, training data. You can also do normalization of each batch uh, that you make sure that the, the values uh, in the layers of the neural network after this uh, of, for each batch remain uh, zero centered. For example, you can calculate the set scores here. And a certain technique, how you can, because that's during training and uh, during um, 
uh, testing, you do not have the information about the batches anymore, but uh, you can also apply that then uh, to your uh, testing data. This is also uh, often used uh, and it often helps to improve uh, the results of your, or the generalization of your neural nets. Another important technique is dropout. So like in the stochastic gradient descent, we uh, randomly uh, fetch our training data. In the dropout approach, we randomly um, delete nodes in the neural network. You might first think this is a crazy thing to do. Why do we do that? But since the, the network is overparameterized, we have too many nodes somehow. And what sometimes can happen that these nodes somehow co-adapt so that certain nodes uh, provide a bad solution then other nodes further down actually correct a bad solution that was uh, done before. We don't need to do that really. And you can avoid that a little bit if you if you randomly drop these nodes out, so you can avoid this co-adaption and the network is forced uh, to do uh, less these or uh, to do to provide better solutions uh, for the train. Then uh, the number of regularization is is not uh, finished yet. So, but these are all very powerful regularization. For example, skip connections, um, which was which is used in this ResNet, this very deep uh, network that also won this uh, ImageNet competition. So it seems to be a powerful technique. Um, what happens in very deep network or in recurrent networks is that these networks start to forget the deeper you go, uh, start to forget what the actual input was. And that sometimes can be a problem. And what you can do is uh, to add the so-called skipped connection. So re reintroduce the original input at certain points in your network, basically to refresh uh, the, the network at this point. And uh, it is shown that this uh, leads to smoother, uh, activate, uh, smoother loss uh, functions and also to better uh, generalization results. Then uh, very powerful as well, you can use transfer learning. So especially it's often done in this language uh, processing, you take a model that was trained on a huge amount of data, something you couldn't do yourself uh, because you don't have uh, the computational resources for that. But you can take the model and its parameters and then adapt that model to your uh, data you have in your lab, and that can be a very powerful approach. But finally, it also defines uh, the starting point of your gradient descent, and it gives you a starting point that is already close to a very good solution. Also very powerful is state augmentation. So instead of, for example, for images, instead of just giving that one images of the image of the dog, you take the dog and you shift it a bit in the frame or you rotate it a little bit, you add a little bit of noise. Again, you uh, avoid that the network just learns that specific uh, image of a dog, but it has to generalize a little bit more and that will lead to a better performance on the test. Marcus, there is one question. Ah, yeah, sorry, Vandrila answered that. <laughs> If the, the node and neuron were the same thing, if uh, the terms are the same, but one really yes, answer that. Yeah, thank you. So we are almost done now with the regularization. Um, there are also this kind of standard machine learning regularization like L1 or L2 regularization, which just keep the weights small. Uh, at the very beginning, we learned that small weights correspond to smooth transitions, so to uh, better generalization often. And by forcing the weights to be small, uh, we can often improve the results a little bit. It usually doesn't have a huge effect. It's not crucial for the neural networks, um, but it can improve. But you can also set constraints, hard constraints on the weight, or you can set hard constraints on the gradients. But, and this is the big part here, we don't really need that for the neural network. We need it to improve, uh, to push uh, the performance of a neural network, maybe to improve it by 10% or something like that. But the neural network also works without this regularization technique as 
again nicely shown in this uh, paper here uh, by Zong et al. And especially gradient descents and early stopping, this combination is often sufficient to find a good solution, but you can improve the solution with additional regularization techniques. Now, which regularization work best for your problem? Uh, again, something you need to either learn from other work that has been done before or just experiment with it. Okay, maybe this was uh, quite technical part here and uh, we want to now go on to the next part and discuss a bit how well can these deep neural networks actually generalize and how robust is this generalization. So this is still, I mean, there's a lot of progress being made in understanding how these neural deep neural networks actually work, these highly over uh, parameterized ones. Uh, but I don't think, at least I'm not aware of a really uh, overarching mathematical description that really describes that well. It also depends very much on the architecture, on the data you have. And so, so it's probably difficult to come up with uh, something that explains it all. Then another important question that is often discussed in papers is whether these uh, deep neural networks actually just interpolate the training data. So they do it very well, uh, better than, for example, uh, a nearest neighbor algorithm, which is also perfect, uh, able to approximate any, any data you want but it doesn't generalize very well. Neural networks approximate any data you want, but they generalize well. That's already a great achievement. But then the question is uh, how this generalization, how far does it go? Does it really reflect the data generation process? So does the neural net really has some idea that these are actual images of, of 3D objects that are alive? Or is it just, a fit in the pixel space. It's probably the, the fit in the pixel space that is true, and we will have some examples on that. But sometimes, especially with this uh, language model, it's really astonishing what they can do, and you almost have the impression there is some intelligence behind. But people who actually look at this uh, seem to think uh, maybe rather not. But yeah, that's probably also an open question. So one of these um, papers here that looks at this generalization power of neural network it was quite a simple test. They looked at, at images. You see here uh, this image of the bird. And they just uh, compared it to the performance uh, that a human would have in classifying these images. So they had this um these many people uh, doing this classification and this uh, they have only a very short time to do the classification uh, uh you know, so one second per image or something like that and then this was compared to the performance of this deep neural networks now the, the neural networks actually outperformed the humans uh, for uh if no noise was in the data if the data training data uh, sorry, the test data was very similar to the training data. However, if you start to add noise uh, to your test data, the performance of the neural networks, all of them here, dropped quite quickly, whereas the performance of the human annotators dropped as well. It becomes more difficult to classify noisy images, but much less than uh, the neural network. So the neural networks don't yet have that, the understanding of the images a human has. Also what the neural networks have the tendency to do is uh, if they don't know what it is, they kind of, uh, they choose a class a bit by chance and they always have the tendency to choose a bit the same class. So the, everything that do not quite know how to classify that put in the class of airplane or the class of dog or something. And the humans don't do that. The humans still try to distinguish uh, what, what is in that image. 
so in you, you can say the neural networks were great actually better than humans for if the training data if test data is close to the training data but if you start changing uh, the, the characteristics of the data the performance drops also quite um astonishing is is uh, what is similar for a convolutional neural network is not similar for humans here they looked in this paper they looked at uh, input so these are input images that create the same activation pattern in a certain way so this is the original image here then you look for images these are just examples uh, of these images that creates the same input pattern in layer one you see it's very close to that original image but the further down you go in the neural network the more distinct uh, this image these patterns become for example in the final layer this input pattern produces exactly the same result as this image here, which for us looks like noise for the neural network this looks like a dog so this is kind of astonishing. The, the other astonishing fact is if you take the same ResNet, you train it a little bit different or you param parameterize it a little bit differently, um, it creates a similar image, but this neural network here will not classify this image as a dog. So it's not transferable from network to network. It's really network specific. And this is uh, maybe to a certain extent a little bit overfitting. So the, the neural network really just interprets pixels and it doesn't have a more uh, global context. This can, that plenty of these examples, uh, funny ones, as you will see. Um, in this, uh, these are these adversarial attacks uh, where the people developed algorithms to uh, in this case, we change a single pixel in the image that changes the classification of the image. And it was for about 70% of the images in this data set, it was possible to find such a pixel. So you just change the value of one pixel and the classification swaps. So that horse becomes a frog. Um, the, the deer, well, already very difficult, becomes a dog. This is understandable, maybe. Um, that chip becomes an airplane. You again see that uh, it somehow seems to like airplanes and dogs at network. So a lot of times when it just changed that pixel, it just puts it into the, the kind of default class, let's say. And you can even push that a little bit further. You can not change one pixel, but you can also train uh, with gradient descent, look for patterns uh that change the classification and uh, then add these patterns to your image and the image almost looks the same you don't see a difference between this truck and this truck and this truck is just the original truck plus that uh, pattern here and uh, the same thing for that uh, bird here or for that pyramid and the aim is to classify all these um, objects here into uh, a specific object. And you will not guess what that specific object is, obviously, because only the neural network was and that object is that case an ostrich. So all these uh, cars and birds were classified as ostrich. And you, because you force the neural network to do so, so the neural network, to a certain extent, is a little bit foolish and we can fool it quite easily with these adversarial attacks. Now, we can do something about these adversarial attacks. Um, so the one thing you can do is uh, these adversarial examples are actually quite useful because uh, if we add them to our training data, we can again force the neural network to classify them correctly and to avoid a little bit this maybe overfitting they do. And this has been done in, in several publications. It has been shown that this is really uh, a good idea. Also, the adversarial example by themselves are not robust. So if you again change them a little bit, the classification will again change. Um, and so if we had a means to calculate the confidence of our outputs, 
uh, then we might be able to uh, detect these uh, adversarial examples or detect in general examples where the network actually doesn't know how to do the classification, but just or more or less randomly assigns it to one of the clocks. And this work has been done. So these are the Bayesian neural networks, which use a dropout or data sampling or other techniques, basically to sample um, outputs, and then you get a distribution of outputs, and you can uh, evaluate whether variance of that distribution is small, in which space of the image, for example, that you can have more confidence uh, or when the when the variance is large, you have less confidence in the identification. A, another very interesting approach, which I will present briefly here, is the evidential uh, learning, uh, which uh, was in, invented in 2018 for classification and 2020 for regression. And this is a very interesting approach. It does the same thing basically as uh, Bayesian neural networks, but it, it does it much faster. Um, so the first thing it does, it has like a, I don't know. The, the network knows how to say, I don't know. Um, and it doesn't just, if it doesn't know, assign it to uh, more or less random class. And this is a powerful, a tool I recommend that you read the paper here. So what they did here is these are just handwritten digits is a one and they just turned that one uh, rotated it and I said this may be back to the question we had before if the rotated one is not in the training data the network doesn't really know what to do with it so it will assign it uh, more or less randomly to the number two uh, in this region here and to the number five in this region. Whereas this evidential deep learning has this I don't know class basically, and it says, okay, here I know it's a one. And here again, I know it's a one, but in between, I don't know what it is. I just give it that onion, which is actually a very uh, good idea. And how do they do that technically? They, instead of predicting class probabilities, they predict the parameters uh, of a Dirichlet distribution. Maybe you know that from the uh, statistics and machine learning course. These are kind of prior distributions for probabilities. And uh, here is a simple uh, iris data set with three classes. So we have three. Um, outputs here. So perfect probability, probability one for one class and zero for the others, is in the corner of the triangle and uh, complete uh, unknown, or if you really don't know what it is, uh, corresponds to a uniform distribution within the triangle. So for objects where we have a lot of evidence, that's why it's called evidential learning, uh, we will give it we will uh, give it a probability distribution that's very centered here uh, in one of the corners of uh, this triangle. Uh, for objects that where we certainly know it's one of these two classes, the, uh, the distribution will be centered between these two classes, but again towards an edge. And for uh, objects where we really don't know what it is, we will have a distribution that is more or less flat and uh, centered in the middle. And like this, we can also, we can detect that when the distribution is flat. So in this case, we can say it's an unknown and we can put that to the unknown clock. Technically how it works is uh, we have, uh, we learn, instead of learning the output probabilities, we learn the parameters of a Dirichlet distribution. These are these alphas here. Um, and uh, we have now uh, two terms. We have the term that uh, basically the traditional term, but we also have a regularization term. And that regularization term makes that if we don't know what it is, we do not randomly assign it to a class, but we do assign it to this unknown class uh, that is characterized by a uniform uh, distribution of this probability. And the interesting thing here is that can all be packed into this loss function. 
So we can learn the same thing with a gradient descent. We just need to change the loss. And uh, we can include that unknown class. And we also get an estimate of the, the precision of our uh, classification, which is can be very useful uh, result as well. And so this uh, makes this uh, evidential learning much faster than uh, this invasion approach. Okay, so that was it uh, from that part. I think it's time to have maybe another break, another question answer session. Um, and then I go to the last part uh, where I will present some applications of deep learning uh, in biology and medicine. Maybe a 10 minute break or something, or maybe a bit longer till 11. This time we do um, uh, a real break and then we leave the questions for in, from 10 minutes from now. Uh, yes. So, what do you propose? Sorry, I didn't know. Uh, I propose that we do a, a real break. For 10 minutes so okay. then we turn All off right, the camera the for 10 okay. minutes and then when people come back yeah then we do a question uh, a q a session as well and then then you start from there okay all right okay all right. 10 minutes break everyone see you there <laughs>
You have one minute break. Great. So far, we in time. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's see if the people are coming back and if they have any questions now. Use this mm. moment. And now we have also Vandri that is online, so he's answering the, the, the questions in the chat. Okay. I didn't forward them all to you because he answered them. So everyone, if you're back from your break, you can put your questions in the chat or turn on your microphone and ask as well. Always good. There's one question. I have a question about missing data. Do you have any recommendations if we are dealing with hard data such as clinical data that cannot be oops, that cannot be imputated? Which neural networks are the best approach? It really depends. If it's clinical data in the sense of tabular data where you have different rows with categorical uh, numerical variables, a mix of all, I'm not even sure whether neural networks are that good. I have a slide on that. Uh, also, my own experience is that neural networks for this type of data, especially if the data sets are fairly small, don't seem to give uh, an advantage compared to, for example, XGBoost or logistic regression. Um, now, with regards to imputation, I wouldn't know how whether neural networks are really capable of imputing such data. It really depends on the data. But maybe other methods might be even better than neural for this type of data. There's another question as well. Thank you. Thank you very much for the great talk. I may miss, may miss this, but my question is, are usually the last layer embedding the most informative ones? Yeah, I would say so. And there's another one. Can deep learning models handle imbalanced data well? Um. I would say, like any other machine learning uh, approach, you you can handle imbalanced data. Um, it's better if the data is balanced, obviously, but uh, I think you sh you can handle imbalanced data if the imbalance is not not too low. Um, I think that you can also provide uh, the information to the neural network that the data is imbalanced. And I'm not 100% sure anymore. I have to look at Hey, I think the neural networks are, I mean, they are popular to deal with imbalanced data, but um, the, 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 there's a limit. It cannot do anything. Yeah, um, sure. So um, usually people can do with um, the data augmentation, the methods like uh, generate uh, synthetic data from, from the kind of distribution that we have in the data itself. Yeah, we said the method like a DGA and yeah, for oh, alternative uh, modeling. Yeah, what, what you usually do is you can adapt your loss function so you can give more weight in your loss function to the small data set. So you blow up a bit the importance of that small data set in comparison. Uh, so you compensate a bit the, the number of training examples. I, I know this, this is the way it works for a uh, Logistic regression or XGBoost, for example, but with neural networks, I forgot. Maybe. This is the same way to do it, but I suspect that there's something like that we can do that as well. There's another question as well. What is reinforcement deep learning? Just a type of deep learning architecture, or is it something different entirely? Well, reinforcement learning is is a, a method in machine learning. It doesn't really need to be linked to um, to neural networks, but uh, recently neural networks have been used uh, in reinforcement learning to predict. Uh, what you do there, you predict actions that give you a reward in the future, and to predict these actions, for example, in a game, uh, which chess uh, figure you want to put where. 
um, there you need uh, you use uh, neural networks very efficiently to uh, predict which action is the best to do at the moment. But there are actually two different things. Right, I don't think we have any other questions for the moment. So I think we are good. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. So let's go uh, to the last part. Um, where I, this is kind of a subjective uh, uh, selection of, of papers uh, that uh, use deep learning. Uh, for uh, biological or medical uh, problems. And there are several ways you can do that. Uh, as was already discussed, you can maybe train your own, your own network from scratch. But for that, you need a certain number of data items in each class. Uh, I'm not capable really to give you a number, but if, if I had to give one, uh, I would say maybe something like 10,000 per class uh, you should have. But it's maybe not what you want to do. Maybe what you want to do is more this, uh, in the language modeling, you call that few short learning, or it's also called transfer learning or fine tuning, uh, where you take a pre-trained model and fine tune it uh, to your specific problem. That means you kind of use uh, the weights of the pre-trained model as uh, starting values, and then you refine these weights by training it maybe on your smaller data set uh, you have at hand in, in your lab. Then we have zero-shot learning, where you, this when you, for example, take a tool like AlphaFold or a tool that is ready to use or an embedding that is ready to use without doing any further training. So as obvious, uh, in machine learning, the data sets need to be uh, well annotated, otherwise uh, the training uh, or the, the generalization will suffer. Um, usually deep learning works well for data that, uh, that has a lot of uh, correlations within it and uh, hierarchical structures like sequences. Uh, images or text, uh, that is where deep learning really does well. For tabular data, my experience is I tested a little bit there, but uh, I didn't get super good results with uh, deep learning. Um, then you should have, if you, especially if you want to train yourself, you should have uh, the computational resources and also the time to do so. You. Uh, there are no general rules if how many layers you need, which activation function is the best. You really have uh, to gain some experience in that and just to test uh, everything uh, or at least the most important parameters uh, before you uh, do the actual training. And of course, if the problem is too simple, don't use deep learning. Uh, that, Many, many statistical methods, very well established methods, robust methods already available. And often they're actually enough to, uh, to solve the problem if the problem is fairly simple. But if you really want to go, to go the extra mile, you might want to use deep learning, but then you also need the time to do so and you need the data uh, to do so. Okay, so here are some examples which I found uh, interesting. Uh, this is a paper uh, that is uh, not yet peer reviewed, but it's on, on Met Archivix um, already. And uh, it deals with heart disease. So a lot of people with heart problems go to a clinic and they're tested there, and uh, but the diagnosis at uh, the, this mission is that they actually don't have a problem, but then uh, this might be a miss, quite often is a misdiagnosis, and they might uh, suffer a heart attack later on, which you could avoid by giving them the proper treatment. So the idea here was that uh, you take uh, a, a language model, this is the long form model in this case, which was pre trained on a lot of data. It works well also for large text, up to 4,000 words maybe. Uh, that language model produces an embedding 
and then uh, map all your documents. So uh, they do this uh, two shot learning here. They, they have this discharge uh, reports and to uh, retrain the model on these uh, reports and then to classify whether these uh, patients have a heart condition or not. And uh, they did this, and uh, according to their paper, they actually outperformed the classification that was done by the doctors. And uh, they could better uh, assign uh, or identify patients that have an actual heart problem, which get, would then get the proper medical treatments. And what they also did well, I think they used this Lime package, uh, or you could also use the SHAP package or other packages that help you uh, to interpret the result of the neural net. Neural nets are often a bit black boxes, uh, which might be difficult to interpret. These uh, toolboxes are general machine learning toolboxes. They, they, they work for all types of machine learning models. They inter interpret the results by, they, first and foremost, they give you the words in these reports, which are the most important to make the distinction between a heart problem or not. And then they also highlight these words here in the text, which then allows you to quickly look at the text and uh, maybe double check uh, uh, this diagnosis done by uh, this language model. So I found this actually a very useful and very uh, interesting publication in the medical field. Language models can not only use uh, to analyze or predict words or language uh, or sentences, they can also be used to uh, do the same thing with sequences, protein sequences, for example. Um, there you train the language model not by predicting a missing word, for example, but by predicting the next amino acid in the sequence. And as the language models, they also produce an embedding. Uh, this is based on, on LSTM or this multiplicative LSTM. Here, uh, Van Du will discuss uh, in his part of the lecture how these LSTMs work. The important thing is that these LSTMs basically scan over the whole sequence and produce these embeddings. These embeddings are then all taken together and produce an embedding of the whole protein. And which is a nice thing. Now you have uh, proteins of different lengths that you can map to the same uh, embedding space. And it turns out like if you do word embeddings, that embedding space will reveal certain structures uh, in these words. The embedding space of the protein sequence also contains lots of information about uh, this protein. For example, you can use that you know, kind of refinement step, use this embedding and train a classifier to predict section, secondary structure of these proteins. And you see uh, that works actually really well. So that structure, uh, secondary structure is somehow already encoded in this embedding. You can predict uh, the stability of the proteins. You can uh, predict diverse functions of the proteins and so on. So these are embeddings uh, of this sequence space are very, it's a very powerful approach. Um, here in this publication, they used uh, this embedding. This was done by this ECM, uh, uh, language uh, model or sequence model um, developed by Meta. Uh, it's an open source model which you can uh, download. And um, it's also, uh, they use this embedding produced by this model to calculate uh, probabilities for amino acid substitutions in general proteins that are viable. So the substitution doesn't lead to a protein that uh, is um, destroyed afterwards because it misfolds, but it leads to a viable protein. Mm. But the, this, yes, there is a question for you in the chat okay. about LLSTMs is a time series neural network. So can we use LLSTM in feature classification? 
in feature classification. Yeah, feature but classification. Or features in, in the sense of uh, economics or... Okay. And that's a good question. Maybe Simon can ask or put that in the chat, a clarification that. Yes, economics, yes. Um, I would say so, yes. I would think. Uh, I mean, they were somehow developed to uh, uh, classify time series. I would just do a Google search and search for LSTMs. Maybe there are more adaptive methods there. I'm not sure. I'm not an expert in that. Too. But I would say yes. Thank you. So they use these uh, probabilities um, to, uh, because an important thing in if you deal uh, if you work in immunology is the optimization of antibodies. So you have an antibody that already somehow works; it binds to the protein you want it to bind to, but maybe not yet uh, efficiently enough. So you want to change uh, the structure of the antibody a little bit. Uh, uh, in order to improve that binding. And for that, you need to know, uh, you go amino acid by amino acid, so you change one amino acid at a time, but you, you need to know which amino acids are the most, have the most highest potential uh, to lead to a successful um, improved binding. And they used uh, this language model here to predict uh, these probabilities. And they uh, showed that the, the model predicts amino acid changes, not only in the variable region of the antibodies, but also in these uh, stable regions. And uh, which was uh, quite astonishing because usually you only uh, adapt this uh, binding uh, region here and not the stable region here. But they found, and this is what was predicted by this model, that these uh, uh, amino acids can also be so again, uh, a nice application of uh, of these language models, this kind uh, in, in a transferring learning way um, to uh, to a problem in in language. Now, maybe you have also read about this uh, what foundation models are. They, these are usually models that are trained on huge amounts of data. And the idea is that the embeddings they produce can then be used uh, for in a refinement process or directly uh, to, uh, to give you information about a certain problem. Um, and these uh, models here were trained on single cell data. So this, the idea is to uh, provide foundation models for single cell data. What they do is they take huge amounts of uh, single cell uh, data, maybe 10 millions or up to 30 millions of these data sets, and they mask some of the um, expression or the, 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 what you measure there is, uh, is RNA and you measure the expression of these RNA genes. And they mask some of the genes and they train the, the model in such a way that you predict uh, the intensity of these mass genes. And it's similar to a language model. Uh, it's also based on this uh, attention and transformer architecture. And uh, it produces also uh, an embedding. And then the, of course, the researcher were wondering how useful these embeddings produced by these models actually are. And it turned out that for single cell analysis, they didn't uh, provide a real advantage. So they didn't perform better or even performed worse than very simple methods that were already present. There are two papers here. This is from Microsoft Research uh, that are obviously interested in this uh, foundation models. And uh, they found that the, it didn't outperform the simpler standard technique. And this is from a different paper here where they uh, looked at how well this uh, embedding can predict uh, gene expression in a test data set. And they found that logistic regression actually outperformed uh, this uh, uh, prediction based on this foundation. 
So I think it's always a very good idea to compare to something like logistic regression if you do deep learning anyway, just to see uh, where you stand. Maybe you don't want to put that in a publication later, but just to, to show you where, where you are more or less in the performance of your model. It's not worth uh, using deep learning if you can do the same thing with a logistic regression. It probably also shows uh, that single cell data is quite complicated data. You have to deal with a lot of missing values. You have batch effects. You have probably a lot of noise in your data as well. And this is just more difficult to handle than maybe images or, or text. And that might also show up uh, in, in, the, in the gene embeddings here. Maybe they're not, the quality of those embeddings is not yet uh, good enough. Now, one of the success stories of deep learning is certainly uh, AlphaFold 2. Um, there are also these uh, CASP uh, competitions where you evaluate all the, the tools that uh, predict the 3D structures of proteins. And uh, each year you publish uh, the sequences uh, of some proteins uh, that where the structure was determined, but the that those structures were not yet published. And then uh, all the uh, participants predict the structures and are evaluated. And in 2018, it was this AlphaFold 1, which was a more traditional neural network that won, um, but in 2020, is a two yearly biannual competition, AlphaFold 2, uh, which was completely redesigned version of AlphaFold 1. Uh, outperformed all the others and uh, provided a huge improvement um, compared to the, the runner-up models. So this uh, AlphaFold model, not for all the proteins and not for all the bits uh, in the proteins, but sometimes they're, they're able to uh, predict structures with an error of less than one angstrom, which is uh, huge, of course. So. The experimental error there is maybe uh, 0.5 angstrom for the very good models. Um, so you come pretty close to that already, which, which is a huge improvement. And how did they uh, do that? So the, the number of training data you have, they use PDB for training. So you have about 200,000 or so uh, structures in PDB, uh, which you can use uh, for that. So this is not such a huge uh, data set for the complexity of the of the problem. So they were aware of that and they, they knew they, they have to um, uh, do uh, adapt their model, uh, this AlphaFold 2 model, uh, to the training data and also to the problem uh, they have to solve. They cannot just come up with a general neural network that Learns it all. Now, there was a lot of uh, work already done uh, uh, before AlphaFold 2. I mean, they didn't invent everything uh, by themselves, nicely uh, summarized here in this review by all uh, uh, in this review here. And uh, if you want to read that, so there's a whole history that led to this AlphaFold 2 model, but uh, then they used the bits and pieces of these things that were already known and put it together in a really powerful uh, model to predict 3D structures. So the model is uh, just takes a single input, a uh, single sequence as an input, no additional information. All the rest they do uh, themselves. But they have a large database of sequences. So the first thing they do is they match uh, they align this input sequence with this sequence database to, go, to get the multi-sequence alignment. And this multi-sequence alignment, as, as was known, is actually very informative because it tells you which amino acids are conserved, uh, which amino acids change, and which amino acids co-evolute. And if they co-evolute, that's a good indication that they're also structurally somehow near and close by. You can also give it a sequence template, but you don't need to. And uh, the second data structure they use is this uh, pair distance structure. So it just gives you for all pairs of amino acids in the sequence, the distance between these amino acids. 
But at the beginning, you don't know that. It's not initialized. It's, I think it's randomly initialized, but the network will uh, then learn that. So as input, you have this multiple sequence alignment and this pair distance uh, representation, and you pass that on to a so-called deformer block. You see there's 48 neural networks in there, or a, it's a lot of neural networks in there. They use also the transformer architecture. They use very clever tricks. Uh, for example, they use this triangular inequality um, because you know that the structure or the interaction of amino acid is defined by other amino acids that are close by, not by those so much that are far away. So you give more importance to those amino acids that are close by. And they were able to encode that into these uh, neural networks with an attention mechanism. Also very interestingly, the amino acids are it's like our amino acid gas. They don't have links between each other. They're, they're completely free. It's only the, the loss function at the end that gives, if two amino acids are too far away, the loss will be so small uh, that this uh, will not be considered a good solution. So the loss function then forces these amino acids to be close together. And they, uh, with, it's, it's kind of a mix between uh, physical ideas uh, because this, uh, John Chomper here, he's, he's a guy who has been working in, uh, in protein folding for a long time, so he knows a lot about the subject. Uh, and he worked together with these uh, experts on, on neural networks, and they came uh, to get up with this alpha fold, which is kind of a mix of physical ideas and neural network ideas. Then finally, you have this pair representation and uh, sequence alignment, and you need to turn that into a 3D structure, and there's another block uh, that does this, and that gives you a 3D structure first of the backbone, then you have to decide the angles for the side chains. There's also another neural network that does that. And finally, um, at the very end, where they have this structure, they refine the structure with a force field, a classical force field approach, mainly to avoid that uh, side chains overlap or that you have residues that are too far away from each other. So this is fairly complex uh, system, but it turned out that this works extremely well. So it is it works so well that this it is used now by the EBI to predict structures of uh, all the proteins they have in their databases. It's also included in the Swiss or in the Uniprot uh, pages, you can see these alpha fold structures. And it really increased uh, the coverage of uh, proteins, uh, of the protein sequences that are annotated with a structure compared to, for example, the Swiss model repository, which did the same thing, but using uh, different methods by um, using uh, protein templates. Um, AlphaFold is able to predict structures almost close to one angstrom, which is extremely good. But at least in this paper, um, they, sh they uh, showed that this is not quite yet good enough for protein docking, because protein docking really depends on the details or docking of, of molecules to proteins depends on the details how the side, side chains are placed. And the little difference of maybe uh, even a third of an angstrom can make uh, can have a huge effect. So in, in the structure prediction, the, the experimental structure, in the, sorry, the docking prediction, the experimental structures still uh, clearly outperformed the alpha fold predictions. And for the docking predictions, the alpha fold predictions were actually not so much better uh, to the classical uh, or traditional model. But uh, AlphaFold evolves as the paper uh, has 29 authors. Um, so there's a lot of power behind AlphaFold and they will, uh, of course, improve AlphaFold. There's already a new uh, result paper out. They don't talk about the methods uh, they achieve, but they show uh, some of the new results. and. There, they claim that they are now uh, even further decreased the error in the structure prediction 
uh, that gets close to a value that is then also suitable for the document. Um, it may be interesting to see the development of the field uh, because uh, often you want to predict um, de novo sequences. Uh, you can't do a multiple sequence alignment for de novo sequences, and alpha fold relies on this multiple sequence alignment. So uh, maybe they will find uh, tricks and uh, hacks uh, to still do that, or maybe we still. For certain proteins, at least partially, we need to combine alpha fold with some traditional, um, more physical uh, methods or uh, molecular modeling methods. Um, so the ultra high sensitivity has not yet been reached by alpha fold, but they're working on it. And I haven't read really these new results, but I guess they are now already quite close to it. Um, then also very important protein sequences are not just sequences, they have variants, the proteins have PTMs, which can have a large impact on, on their function. And this is not uh, included in alpha fold, also because it's not, you don't see it in a sequence alignment. Uh, it is uh, quite difficult to predict, but they're also working on, on this uh, subject. If you have multi-domain uh, proteins, often the, the prediction within the domain is very good, but then how the domains are organized um, amongst relative to each other, uh, there the prediction is maybe not so great anymore. There's a version of AlphaFold that is able to predict protein complexes. That's a very difficult task, obviously. It's they they actually treat the two proteins at the same. So they mix the residues of the two proteins. And uh, it turns out it works quite well, actually. But there's also uh, improvement to be done. And sometimes you're interested in the conformational space of a protein. So sometimes the protein doesn't have only one conformation, but it might swap from one conformation to the other. And somehow you can detailed a little bit out of the alpha fold results, but it's not yet uh, really implemented. And that would also be something where you might need uh, different approaches uh, to predict basically the entropy of the, of the protein structure. So there's still a lot of work to be done. And it will be very interesting to see how much of that work can be done with deep learning. And for to what extent you will still require um, this traditional uh, molecular modeling approach. Now, the last uh, example here is, is from a bit my field, is from mass spectrometry for those who uh, don't know what mass spectrometry does. So in, in this MSMS approach, you take a protein or usually a whole Cell lysis, uh, so a lot of proteins, you digest them into small bits because mass spec can't analyze whole proteins. And then you separate these peptides with an LC column and you measure MSMS spectra. Um, and these MSMS spectra can then be used, for example, matched against the sequence database, and you can identify the peptide that produced this MSMS spectrum or it can be used uh, to plan quantitative analysis once the identification is done or, of these peptides. And for both approaches, uh, uh, it turned out that spectrum prediction really helps. It helps uh, if you have a peptide sequence and you are able to predict this MSMS spectrum, it helps the matching and it helps, uh, helps the quantitative analysis. And also here, they uh, in this POSIT approach, there are other approaches as well. They were inspired by this uh, language model architecture. So they used um, GRUs, uh, which are uh, the gated recurrent units. This is uh, similar to LSTMs, um, but a bit simplified to uh, parse the, the peptide sequence in two directions. That has some technical reasons why you do that. Then they had a attention layer and to uh, perform an embedding. And uh, this is the encoder. And then they had a decoder, which turned that embedding into an MSMS spectrum. And the quality of these predictions really 
uh, astonishingly good sometimes. Um, and, and if you include these predictions in your scoring methods, you can uh, quite drastically increase the number of uh, identifications you get within a certain force discovery threshold. So this is not a su success story, I would say, of deep learning, also because that paper was produced uh, by a group uh, which is linked to the proteomics DB. So they have uh, about 150 million spectra just uh, at hand, uh, which they can use uh, to learn this uh, type of things. At the very end, uh, just want to mention tabular data. This is data we often have in medical or bioinformatics approaches. These are basically data matrices where one row uh, is, is numerical, the other one, row is maybe categorical. You have a lot of missing values eventually. The rows are uh, poorly correlated to each other. Um, and often you don't have so much data. So in there are some experiments. Uh, they came up with also deep learning models, very sophisticated ones that uh, try to analyze this data. But the performance of these models here in an independent analysis, <coughs> sorry, doesn't seem to be yet uh, comparable to the performance of uh, gradient boosting, which uh, also in my experience performs better on this type of data than this deep learning architectures. Okay, that was my last slide. Uh, I guess time is already over. So uh, maybe if some urgent questions we can answer, otherwise I think it's time for Bambu to take over.